Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. So glad that you're here today. Want to welcome all of you in this room and welcome all of you watching online, especially if this is your first time here to White Flag. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, I also want to say as we get started this uh, morning, uh, thank you to all the volunteers in our church, all of you that that serve behind the scene in whatever way that you serve. You know, today we're celebrating our volunteers and we got a little Christmas room set up with all kinds of uh, great food for them just to honor them. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. If you serve, I want you to hear it from me. Everything that we do happens because of a lot of different people working together. And so this is a great church and you make it a great church and I'm thankful for you. Uh, I want to welcome you to week two of our series, Top Three Misunderstood Verses. Uh, this is a series that, you know, by the time we get into it, it's almost over. It's only three weeks, so we're in the, the middle of it because we just launched it last week, and it's a, it's a series that's really simple. Uh, when you take verses out of Scripture, uh, out of context, I should say, uh, y- you are not doing yourself any favors, right? You know, God wants to speak to us. He wants to give us truth. He wants to change our lives. And we need to hear what his truth has to say. And when we don't hear it in the right way, when we misapply it, uh, we really are missing out on incredible blessings. You know, it's one thing to, to read some random book and to, to not quite catch the plot or uh, to, to cook something or make something and not follow the recipe just right. It, it might come out a little uh, too salty or too bland, but it's not going to like ruin your life or really make a big difference in your life. If you're reading instructions on a project and you, you know, you misunderstand something. You might get something out of square or something's a little crooked here or there, but it's not the end of the world. But when it comes to God's truth, this, this truth that will change your life, we want to hear it and understand it in the way that God meant for us to hear it and understand it. And so that's what this series is all about. Now, last week I started with the, the most popular misinterpreted verse, and that is do not judge. Now, if you missed that, please go back to the website or to the app and download it and listen to it, because that one's a real big one. But, but today's verse is probably tied with or maybe just a hair behind, uh, you know, do not judge as being the most misunderstood and misinterpreted verse. And that is Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13 is, is a verse you probably already know by heart, but it's, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, or through Christ who gives me strength, whatever ver- version you grew up on. Now, th- this, is a, this is a super popular verse, and uh, it is super messed up in terms of application. People get it wrong all the time. I, I got a picture that kind of can show you in just, in just a picture exactly where we're going, not only with this whole series, but with this verse in particular, it says it all. Take a look at this coffee mug. It is so accurate. I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. That says it all, right? I mean, you can pull something out of the Bible to say what you want it to say, and uh, people do that all the time. I will never forget the time that I was at a conference and I, I sat behind this lady who walked in and I immediately noticed her giant like tote bag. And on the side of the tote bag, it had her favorite verse, uh, hand embroidered all the way across it, very colorful, uh, and it said Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And, and as I was sitting there in the, uh, in the uh, lecture, I looked down and I was able to read a little bit more closely her hand stitching. And I noticed that she had spelled Philippians wrong. Philippians, she, she had too many L's and not enough P's, okay? And, and it was all I could do to not lean over to her and say, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength, uh, except spelling, you know, uh, but I didn't. I know it's bad, but I thought it. And uh, it's actually something that constantly reminds me about the misapplication of this verse. Now, uh, how and why? What's going on? Why do so many people misapply this verse? Well, uh, I think it's become like a self-motivational mantra with a little dash of Jesus for folks. That, that's, how, that, that's the 
phrase I use to kind of describe this, a self-motivational mantra to say Philippians 4.13, and it gives them a little dash of Jesus with this self-help stuff, self-motivation, right? Um, This is a big thing in our culture, the self-help books, this idea that you can kind of find everything you need within yourself. If you were to look up self-motivation in the dictionary, it says this, uh, it's the, uh, the ability to drive oneself, to take initiative and action and pursue goals and complete tasks. That's self-motivation. And you know, there's always these people on TV or on the radio telling you to come down to the airport and they're gonna, they're gonna help change your life. And it's all about self-help and, and self-motivation. And what I think has happened is, is some Christians, right, Take Philippians 4.13, and it's become their self-help, self-motivational mantra, something that they can say, and what makes them think it's really special is they add a little dash of Jesus. So they don't just simply say, I can do whatever I set my mind to. They, they say, I, I can do whatever I set my mind to uh, with Jesus' help. And they go, yeah, that's, that's a verse, Philippians 4, 13. And so they begin to say it and say it and say it. And, and what they subtly do, and maybe you've done this as well, is they don't just suggest that if they work hard towards a task, they might be able to achieve it. They think if they add the dash of Jesus, it guarantees success. It guarantees victory. I will make the team because I can do anything through Christ who gives me strength. I will climb the mountain. I'll get all the way to the top because I've said this and I believe this concept and you know, I'm gonna win. It's always gonna end in a guaranteed victory and uh, that's not really the case but that's what they have convinced themselves this verse means. And this is why you see it on so many trinkets and keychains and bumper stickers and t-shirts uh, because they really believe I can do all things. And that's the key of the misinterpretation. All things, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. What does that even mean? All things can mean you know, to one person one thing and to another person another thing. And if it's really all things, then that's okay. So can you do all the bad things you wanna do? Can you do all the things that only Jesus wants to do? I mean, like, what is all things? Well, nobody, nobody takes time to understand that because they just like that it's a verse that empowers them to feel like a winner. Now, the NIV uh, caught this, and I didn't even catch that the NIV caught it. Now, when I say the NIV, that's referring to the, the translation in which I preach from, the New International Version. Um, w- w- when I was a kid, I grew up on the King James Version. How many of you grew up on that translation? Okay, a lot of you. Uh, it was my generation in the 70s uh, that, I think it was 73, that I think the year I was born, the NIV translation came out, or it might have been 77, but my first Bible was a called a parallel Bible. I had the, uh, new, uh, the King James here and then the NIV here. So every page had two columns so that you could learn, uh, oh, this is the new way it's said. Well, a lot of us can remember our verses that grew up as a child the way we first learned them. And so I've always said, you know, the verse, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength or through Christ who strengthens me. But the NIV, just in the last, like, 10 years or seven years maybe even, has changed the translation once again to be more accurate. And this is a better translation. Uh, I didn't notice it until just this week. It now says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, all this is very different than all things, right? I mean, all things means all things. You can take that out of context or in context, and it means, to most people, all things. But all this makes you say, well, what is this? All this limits and actually makes you say, I need to know what's being said in the context to understand what this is. And so I love that they have made the change 
because it's a better translation. But unfortunately, uh, there's already, you know, a generation or two of people who don't understand what this verse means and they've already memorized it for the self-motivational mantra that's misapplied. So today, we're gonna clear that out of your brains. We're gonna help you. And if this is the first time you ever come into the verse, you're gonna learn it the correct way the first time you ever uh, wrestle with it. So let's get into the actual context of this verse and find the real meaning. In order to do that, We're gonna start with context. And today our context is gonna be interesting. We're gonna start out here, like in a context that's way out here. And then we're gonna gonna move into another context, like here. And then we're gonna move into another context here. And then we're gonna finally move into three or four verses surrounding Philippians 4.13. And so we're going way out for the context today. And I think this is gonna be incredibly helpful. The first thing that you need to understand is who wrote this and, and, and what was going on in his life when he wrote it so that you can understand why he might've written it. And so to do that, we need to start with Paul. The apostle Paul is the author of Philippians 4.13. Now, if you don't know this about Paul, Paul was a Jewish man who was a religious leader. He was a part of the Pharisees. He was a, he was a super spiritual disciplined teacher of religion. That's what his job was. Uh, and he was the elite of the elite. Now, a lot of people get this confused. They, they think Paul hung out with Jesus, but Paul never walked with Jesus or hung out with Jesus. And, and that might be like, oh, wow, that's the first time you've ever really thought about this. But when Jesus you know, had his three years of, of earthly ministry, Jesus and Paul never interacted or met. They didn't have any you know, deep moments by the fire talking about life. He was not one of the disciples. Uh, in fact, when Jesus died and resurrected and then ascended into heaven and the disciples began to preach the gospel, Paul was against the gospel. He thought he was on God's side, so he would attack anyone that called themselves Christians or followed Jesus, literally killing them. So so it wasn't until Paul had a supernatural uh, encounter with Jesus that he changed. You know, Jesus shouted at him from heaven, a voice from the clouds, you know, stopped Paul, who at that time was known as Saul, and then there was this Uh, realization that what Paul thought he was protecting God was actually not what was accurate. He had missed the Messiah that God had told him to be watching for. And so he eventually comes to Christ. And when he comes to Christ, man, he goes on a tear trying to communicate to anyone that would listen what Jesus did in his life and who Jesus was and what the message of the gospel was all about. So Paul becomes this traveling missionary. He was the one that was constantly traveling to go to one city to the next to say, hey, anybody here that's a Jewish person like me, let me tell you how wrong I had it and how wrong you've got it. You need to know who Jesus is. Now, we call those his missionary journeys. Like he did one and then a second one, then a third one. And uh, on his second missionary journey, okay, so context, who was Paul? Now we're going to move a little bit uh, you know, closer to the true context of this verse by getting into this city that Paul went to. The city was Philippi. On, one of his, on his second journey, he stopped in Philippi. This is a city. Uh, you know some things about Philippi if you've been in the word of God over the last couple of years of your life or if you've been studying God's word for some time. See if these stories ring a bell. Do you remember the time when uh, it says that, that Paul was preaching and teaching and a woman who was a dealer in purple cloth heard him and then gave her life to Christ and was baptized? Her name was what? Does anybody know? Lydia. Lydia. If, if, is that what you guys said over there, some of you? Okay, yeah. Lydia. We had talked about her a little bit in the, in the series seven. But Lydia came to know Jesus through the ministry of Paul in Philippi. Right after he got done uh, leading her to the Lord, I think he went to his, her house uh, for dinner with some folks and stayed there. Then it says he was walking along the road the next day and some demon-possessed slave girl kept screaming at him and he got irritated with her 
and told her to shut up, basically, and then cast a demon out of the slave girl, which is a nice thing to do, unless uh, you're a pagan and you're using your slave uh, girl or daughter to um, be a freak show on the side of the town marketplace to make some money. And that's what they were doing. So the owners uh, got upset and they went after Paul, dragged him into the marketplace and began to beat him up. And then, of course, he's arrested. Uh, Then you might remember the story where Paul and Silas are in prison and they're singing songs and there's an earthquake and the doors open up, but none of the prisoners escape. And then the jailer's ready to kill himself. But Paul shouts out, no, don't kill yourself. We're all here. Well, that happened in Philippi. And then Paul led that jailer to the Lord, and it says he and his whole family uh, were baptized. Now, all of that happened in Philippi. And so at that point, we know historically that Paul started a church. This is around 51 AD. Okay, 51 AD, Paul starts this church in Philippi. He's got three converts, and maybe they all get together. We don't know the details, but He establishes this church in 51. Uh, Just to give you a time frame, this would be 18 years after Jesus ascended into heaven. If you're like, okay, where where does 51 land, okay? Jesus was 33 when he died. So I think that math is 18. So it'd be about 18 years after Christ ascended, Paul starts this church. Now, with that context, 10 years goes by And Paul will eventually be arrested in Rome in house arrest and he will write a letter called Philippians that he sends back to this church that he starts in AD 51. All right, does that make sense? Now, with that context, I gotta tell you, a lot happened to the life of Paul or in the life of Paul in the 10 years of that space from the time he started that church, to the time that he will write the book or the letter of Philippians. Here's what Paul went through in a short summary form over that space of 10 years. Paul was arrested and placed in either jail or prison multiple times. In addition to that, he was beaten. He was beat up. He was beaten with rods, it says. Uh, He was grabbed in riots and almost torn to pieces multiple times. He received what's called 40 lashes minus one, which I don't know why they just didn't call it 39 lashes, but uh, there was this idea that, man, you know, anything beyond 40 would kill you, you know. Uh, 40 lashes would kill you, so let's stop at 39. But he received a whipping with lashes where he was hit 39 times, five different occasions. And it would kill most people. And yet Paul had to endure that. It says from his own writings that he was homeless at times, that he was poor, that he was hungry. He had ongoing physical ailments. Some people think it was something to do with his eyes. Some people think it was something to do with his hands and it affected his writing. Some people believe that he was a hunchback and that all of this really was an ailment that, that he had to fight through day in and day out. Uh, He was slandered on a regular basis. People would lie about him, gossip about him. People absolutely hated him because he was a voice for the Lord and for Jesus. And so that brought the attacks. He himself writes that he was hunted down by bandits, just straight up thieves and bad guys on the road. He was hunted down by Jews and Gentiles. The Jews hated him because he was a traitor to them. He used to be the leader of the Jews, and then he went team Jesus. And then, of course, the Christians, they were unsure about him because he got his start by killing Christians, but he won them over. But Gentiles, that would be anyone that wasn't a Jew, well, well, they hated him too. And so he had to deal with that over this 10-year period. He would go on trial where people would make false accusations. He would have to stand and defend himself and no one would believe him. And they would move him from prison cell and jail cell to different cities, different people. Even along the way, they would stick him on boats, ships, and, and sail him across bodies of water where he would, of course, be shipwrecked 
because nothing was easy for this guy. He'd end up on, a, on an island and a snake would bite him. And I mean, this guy went through you know what and back over these 10 years. And it all landed him, not in some glorious position, but under house arrest in Rome. And let me just tell you, all of these hardships are important for the content uh, to give you context so that you know what he's talking about in Philippians 4.13 when we get there. But I want you to notice this. Paul didn't look like a winner. He was God's man. He was speaking the truth. He was taking the high road. But if you looked at him, everybody assumed he was the loser. There was nothing about him that, that like positioned him as, wow, it's obvious that this guy is good, righteous, and God's man, the world, man, they just beat him down and saw him as a loser. So now he's under house arrest. Some of you might think, well, that doesn't sound as bad as like, you know, full on dirty, dank, you know, dark jail cell arrest. This sounds like kind of like a, you know, our modern day version of uh, somebody who gets a ankle collar and, uh, you know, they, 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 they're being tracked and they're supposed to stay at home, but they still can get some Cheetos and watch Netflix all night. That's, that's not so bad, right? Some of you are like, that's, that's my life, what you just described without the ankle bracelet, right? Uh, <laughs> um, well, let me just tell you, it, it wasn't a breeze. When you hear house arrest, first of all, you need to understand it was for two years. The Bible does say that Paul could could teach, and this did not keep him from writing. It didn't keep him from having visitors or him leading people to the Lord if they came to his house. Uh, it was like a rented space. But for two years, do you realize he was chained inside his home to another human being, to a guard, to a soldier? I, I don't know what's worse. I mean, would you rather be in a dark, cold cell by yourself with not such great, you know, freedom, but, you know, alone with some privacy. I don't know how much privacy, but, or would you rather be like in your rented house chained 24 seven, think about that for a second, to another person, I, you know, pick your poison, but this was not a breeze, right? And so this is where we find Paul when he finally Sits down at a table, I imagine, you know, he's got his hand, you know, he's chained to this dude. He's like, hey, scoot over a little bit more here. Let, let me be comfortable. And he begins to write a letter to his friends in Philippi. He's in Rome and he writes the book of Philippians, which is really just a personal letter to the Christians at the church that he had launched 10 years earlier. It'd be like if I left today and then wrote you guys a letter 10 years from now because we had stayed in contact. So that gives us even more context. Now we're, we're, we're in the book, right? Paul's life, the city of Philippi, his current situation. Now we're in the, the letter, the book, Philippians. What's that all about? Well, the broad context for that, because I can only give you the cliff note version, is this. When Paul writes this letter, He's basically writing a personal letter of encouragement to these Christians to tell them, listen, it is possible if you focus your life on Christ, if you're faithful to Christ, it is possible to thrive, not just survive, and to endure the sufferings of this life with joy and strength. That's what the big message is in Philippians is be joyful and know that your relationship with Christ will see you through suffering and difficult times. That's the, the big idea in his letter of encouragement. And so with that, he gets to the very end. Philippians 4 is the end and he's just wrapping things up and he's thanking them for having sent some goodie bags and some supplies and a friend that came and visited them. And it's in this small little context that we now get to the verses immediately surrounding, 
surrounding 4.13. I wanna look at verse 10 and 11 and 12, and then we will find the truth to this verse. Look at Philippians 4, verse 10. Paul writes, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. So in this verse, Paul's basically saying, um, I'm, I'm glad you finally you know, connected with me because I was wondering, but I, I know it wasn't because you didn't love me. You just, it, the, the, the timing just wasn't right. You couldn't get here to see me. You couldn't provide me with the stuff I needed. And, and that's cool. I know you're trying. I'm just so happy to finally be reconnected. He then says in verse 11, <clears throat> I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now, this is the first clue. If it's your Bible or your phone, you should underline, learn to be content, because this is the actual immediate context. He is talking about contentment. He's saying, I I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. Look at verse 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content. Underline that. Now we know for sure that the established immediate context of this passage is contentment. Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Now think about it, now that you know the context, go back to that list that I just shared with you. The list said, summary, Paul went through all of these hardships, ups and downs, it wasn't easy, they were extreme, more extreme than probably you and I have ever faced in our lives, and he's saying, I've learned the secret because I went through all that, whether it was up or down, of being content. I know what it is. And then he says it in Philippians 4.13. Finally, our verse in context says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, now that, that gives you an immediate, I know what the this is all about. I see that it's not all things. It's not like I I can build a roller coaster in 24 hours. I mean, right? That's what popped in my head. Because that's what people do. I can have a a three-bedroom home with a three-car garage. I can do it through Christ who gives me strength. You you, you see how it starts to go off some weird left field if you don't know that he is saying, I can do all of this. What is the this? I can be content. I can be content no matter what, good or bad. I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. You see, what's so important about the context of this verse is that it immediately shows you how wrong most people have it and maybe even you. It was never a verse intended to be a determination verse. It was always meant to be an endure verse. And there's a big difference. This verse is telling us that we can suffer and we can lose And we can experience crushing defeat, but can endure it with the help of Christ. Nothing about victory, everything about defeat, that we can endure. It was never intended to be, with God's help, I can accomplish whatever I set my mind to. It was never even in that context. No, 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 it's more like, with God's help, I can make it through the soul-crushing, physically exhausting, emotionally challenging, completely unfair thing called life. That's what this verse is about. This verse isn't meant to inspire willpower. No, it is completely the opposite. It's about 
realizing the complete, utter dependence on Christ that we all must have to survive. And that's very, very different. You see, Paul is not saying name it and claim it, which so many people want you to believe. That's not the message of the gospel and it's not the message of Paul's life. Not if you look at Paul's life, because why wouldn't he have just named it more and claimed it more? He ended up dead. They killed him, he was a martyr. Why would he be martyred if he gets everything he names and claims? Paul wasn't saying that. Paul was saying, look, if you, the way I've set this context up for you, I've dedicated my whole life to Christ. I have traveled all over the world and left it all on the table and it didn't all work out great for me. It wasn't easy. It wasn't all, you know, rainbows and kittens. That's Paul's message. Paul wants to remind you, you're not always gonna finish first. Everybody doesn't get a trophy. Sometimes the bad guy wins. Sometimes you won't have enough money in your bank account. Sometimes the tumor is still there even after you pray. Sometimes you don't get the girl. You don't get to have children. You don't get to have the white picket fence. The message that Paul is trying to communicate is, I have learned to be content every single day when everything didn't go my way, only because of the strength and the joy that I received through Christ. I can't do this without him. I will be able to do this with him. Do what? Have victory all the time? No, endure. I don't mean to be a downer, folks, but man, if you haven't figured out that life is about enduring and not one high after the next, you just don't know what life is about yet. And the world is trying to sell you a lie that it can be here. Many of you are trying to convince yourselves of that on Instagram and Facebook every single day. You're trying to project, it's always up here and everything's great. It ain't. And if you really are honest with yourself, you know it. So quit trying to live in this fake place where you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength and start understanding that you can endure suffering with the help of Christ. That's the message. You see, Paul has learned to be content. He says the secret of, content, of contentment is that I've realized Jesus will be faithful to sustain me. And you need to have that in those moments of down, of crushing defeat. Here's a phrase that the Lord laid on my heart to say it all. If I'm with Jesus, then Jesus is with me and everything's gonna be okay. That is a mantra for you. And if I'm with Jesus, then he's with me and everything will be okay. You know, we don't like suffering. We don't wanna talk about suffering. We wanna talk about winning. We wanna talk about victory. We wanna talk about having everything. We never really wanna talk about suffering. But can I tell you, it's in the space of suffering that we are finally emptied of ourselves. And that's where we truly meet God. It's there. That's where the growth happens. That's where the joy is found. That's where the strength is really felt. When you live in this space where you get to claim victory and you're gonna claim that the task is gonna be done, guaranteed because you threw in a little dash of Jesus, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, and you take into uh, no consideration what is the kingdom mind of God versus what are your selfish, you know, uh, selfish desires, when you never take that into account, when you think it's always about being victorious and, and having enough and it's never about suffering, you miss everything. This world isn't what God has to offer us. He has eternity. And when you try to make this world great at the expense of never getting to know truly the one who will sustain you for all of eternity, you're missing out. 
Jesus wants you to know he'll be there with you in your suffering and this world will give you more suffering than victory. So get used to it, turn to him, be with him and he will then fulfill you, sustain you, give you joy and give you contentment. And when you finally just come to grips with that, it changes the perspective you have on everything. And so Philippians 4.13 now you know the full context and the accurate application. Every time you see the trinket, every time you see the t-shirt, every time you see the bumper sticker, every time you see some athlete, you know, kind of say right before the Super Bowl, I think we're gonna win because I, I believe, you know, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's great. I'm glad they're talking about God, but you can kind of go, yeah, but I don't know that he's really talking about football. Yeah, I know, uh, but I don't know that he's really talking about getting the promotion. Yeah, I know, I know that this is really talking about the hardest times of life. He's there and he sustains and he can allow us to be content and you will never misinterpret it again. Thanks for listening. Let me pray and wrap us up. Father, this passage is so important I pray that not a, a, a sense of depression or, you know, man, that was so, uh, you know, down, that life is so rough isn't the message that people hear. I, I pray that they are filled with joy and they are inspired to know, hey, I would rather know the truth. The truth is life is hard. And I want the right answers and the right verses that will help me in those hard times. That is something to rejoice about. That is something to be thankful for. And so we're so thankful for your word and how clear it is and the examples that people give us like Paul, what a life he led. Father, nobody thought he was the winner. Uh, he looked like a loser, but indeed he had discovered the secret. Help us to discover that same secret. Thank you for your grace and your love through it all. It's in your son's name that we pray. Everybody says, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.